Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Salam alaikum. Azul Flawen, bonjour. <laughs> Welcome to uh, the uh, this symposium celebrating the 60th anniversary of the independence of Algeria. Uh, my name is Dr. Aisha Belkadi, and I'm a lecturer here at SOAS working on uh, Amazigh languages. Um, I wasn't supposed to chair the whole event, but I'm going to chair the whole event because unfortunately we have a couple of colleagues who are off sick. My colleague, Dr. Ida Hajib Ayanis, who organized it all, and Dr. Arthur Aseraf, who is there, um, who is ill with COVID. And uh, we wish you uh, a speedy recovery, Arthur. So I'm very happy and, and proud to chair this event as the daughter and the granddaughter of uh, Algerians who were born in uh, who were born as colonized subjects in their own land and whose lives trajectories were uh, strongly impacted by uh, colonization. But I'm also happy to be here as a scholar who is passionate about the uh, cultural heritage of Algeria the rich history of the country, the diversity of its people, the diversity of its languages, and um, of how much um, of, of the history of the country is encapsulated, uh, particularly in the languages um, that are spoken all across um, Algeria. So we are all very honored here at SOAS uh, to be hosting this event and to host all the wonderful speakers, the wonderful scholars who agreed to uh, participate in our panel, uh, in our panels, and who um, agreed to share their expertise on um, uh, colonial history, uh, colonial uh, legacy, and and the development of Algeria in the past sixty years. So I will now um, ask Ida to say a few words. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> you're welcome to SOAS. So my name is uh, Ida Hajibayanes and I am lecturer here at SOAS as well. Just like Aisha, we're in the same department. So today we feel really privileged to welcome all of you, especially Mr. Lunes Magaman, who is the ambassador for Algeria, and Mr. Hamed Usama Salhi, the cultural attaché, as well as Kader Mayer, our COO. Um, so now um, I actually had the privilege of organizing this event together with my colleagues, uh, Wayne Doling, Aisha Belkadi, and, and, and Sunil Pan, okay, together with uh, Hamid Salhi. And it was just very um, enlightening and exciting as well. So when Mr. Hamid Salhi approached us with the idea, we first thought that um, the Algerian revolution has given so much. Uh, what played out in, in Algeria, the whole settler Berber dynamics, the struggle for independence and how the nationalist forces shifted the colonial power was inspirational for so many African countries and beyond. And so it was very, very important for the Center for African Studies and for SOAS to celebrate this. And Aisha Belkadi reminded us, she said, we must host this because remember what Amil Cabral said, he said, Christians go to the Vatican, Muslims go to Mecca and revolutionaries go to Algiers. And so today here, I hope we'll all be able to celebrate and um, uh, learn a lot. Thank you. So I think I pass the mic on to um, our chair for Center for African Studies, Wayne Dooling. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ida. And let, let me start, first of all, by saying thank you to Ida, who did all the hard work of organizing uh, sort of today's event. And of course, just thank our, our colleagues and staff from the uh, Algerian Embassy for approaching us uh, in the first place. I, I won't keep you for any length of time. I'm, I'm here merely to welcome you in my capacity as chair of the Center of African Studies. Uh, thank you very much for coming. We have an audience in person, and uh, we have an online audience. I, I, sorry, I can't actually tell how many people we have online, but I suspect it's a fair number of people who are online. Um, and I'll just um, conclude on a personal note to say that I'm. It would be remiss of me as a South African not to mention that um, my country, South Africa, has very close ties with Algeria. And Nelson Mandela, our first post-apartheid president, of course, went to Algeria. It was the first. A uh, significant African country he visited um, 
during his years of exile and uh, went to Algeria specifically to get military training with the FLN, the National Liberation Front, and uh, spoke uh, in uh, subsequent years after his release from prison, spoke uh, extremely highly of his time with the FLN in Algeria and said something like it was after returning from Algeria that I became a man, referring very specifically to his military training. So it's a great honor for me to, to be here uh, uh, today as well in a personal capacity as well as my as my role as chair of the Central African Studies. So thank you very much, uh, Aisha. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to ask our CEO, Hadir Mir, to say a few words on behalf of SOAS Directorate. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kadir Mir. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at SOAS, and uh, representing really uh, the executive and the and the board of trustees. Um, uh, Adam, our director, is in New York at the moment, so couldn't be here. So he uh, he asked me to represent him and gives his apologies. Um, I'd also like to welcome our very special guests, Lunas and uh, um, Hamid, uh, who we uh, who were incredibly pleased to be able to to be able to host. Um, I've been here at SOAS for about a year now, just under a year, and um, it's clear that when you walk into SOAS or you walk onto the campus, um, uh, it's a it's a hotbed of political debate, discussion, uh, disagreement. Um, uh, but what you get at SOAS is a level of passion, uh, uh, a passion about who we are, what we stand for, and the types of discussions that we have. And that ranges from you know, economic, political, cultural, security, religious challenges across the world. Sometimes quite a lot of those arguments are had internally, um, uh, uh, which can be challenging for management, but, but, that's, but let's, let's put that aside. Uh, so we challenge the status quo. Uh, uh, we, challenge, we challenge the status quo and we ask challenging questions. Uh, and we also seek to understand complex matters. Uh, and uh, my apologies. Should put that up. <laughs> apologies. Um, and I think today's event is 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 just that. It's a commemoration of the 60th anniversary of Algeria's independence, but it brings together international experts, including many from Algeria, to discuss and debate some of those issues. So it's an absolute pleasure to host that. Um, one of the things that we're really proud of is the work that we've done in decolonizing decolonizing the curriculum. And I think uh, we are one of the foremost universities in the UK, if not in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, leading that debate, leading that discussion, and demonstrating uh, how we can how we can how we can decolonize the agenda uh, and, and the curriculum. And I, uh, and I think hosting events like this uh, and engaging in those debates uh, only, can only support, facilitate, and enable and strengthen that. And the other piece that we are we are very very focused on is equitable global partnerships. So we are very interested in partnerships with institutions in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and but in a way that challenges again the status quo um, uh, to avoid kind of the financial and the brain drain that comes with some of those partnerships as they currently exist. And and and, and what I hope through today's discussions and debates is that we can look to see how we can develop and strengthen that with Algeria, for example, and, and that's something that we've touched on. Uh, we're very interested in internet in partnerships with higher education institutions in Algeria, and I hope from this discussion and from some of the meetings that we've had today, we can look to progress that and strengthen it. So a huge thank you. Thank you very much for attending, and thank you for choosing us to host And now I'm going to ask Mr. Ambassador to say a few words. Thank you very much, Mrs. Aisha, for your kind words. And thank you very much for the university who was this first step of our program on celebrating the on the celebration of our 60th anniversary of independence. So, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Mrs. Zainab Badawi and Professor Adam Habib, Director of SOS, for their valuable assistance in the organization of this conference. I would like also to thank Mr. Kadir Mir 
and Miss Ida Hadji Bayanis for organizing the conference commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Algeria's independence. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the Algerian and British professors and doctors and the students who have agreed to participate with us in this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, this celebration is a moment of recollection in memory of the one and a half million martyrs of the Algerian revolution of the 1st November 1954 that restored our national sovereignty and independence. This revolution was marked by struggles, sacrifices that led to the liberation of the country. Through the evocation of our dramatic past following the French colonization, we are exercising our duty of memory towards our ancestors, millions of whom fell as resistance, fighters and mujahideen. Others were imprisoned and or deported, while millions of Algerians were dispossessed of their lands and properties. Our people still demand recognition of their suffering from yesterday's colonizers, which implies recognition of the truth of history, the issue or the concern of the memory still remains on the table and constitute one of our priorities. After independence, there was a great effort to build the Algerian state, illustrated by a development in all fields. The Algerian inherited a destroyed country following the war against the colonizer but took up the challenges, many challenges. For example, universities in Algeria have made a considerable leap forward, extending their network of infrastructure to all the regions with a student <coughs> population that it is set to reach 2 million in the very near future. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us at this conference, which is jointly organized by the Algerian Embassy in London and SOS, University of London, our speaker who will discuss various facets of topics relating to the independence and post-independence of Algeria. What makes this conference rich is that we have speakers from different backgrounds, namely historian, political scientist, anthropologist, and economist, leading thus the discussion open to an audience composed of both Algerian and British nationals. We hope that this initiative will contribute to further highlighting our history, which is considered an important part of modern history and help the British audience, in particular, to better understand why Algerians are so proud of their history and so attached to their sovereignty. In conclusion, I would like to thank you all for your presence today and wish this meeting every success my warmest wishes and regards for all of you, and thank you very much for hosting this event. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I think you have to leave us very soon, no? Yeah. So just feel free to leave. Thank you. Right, so we have two uh, panels um, that are planned this afternoon. The first one, uh, is on the theme of anti-colonial histories. We were supposed to have three speakers, but one of them, Professor Ali Tablit from the University of um, Algiers cannot uh, join us today. So it's only going to be two speakers. So we're gonna uh, be listening to Professor Belkacem Belmeki, who is professor in British and Commonwealth Studies at the University of Oran. His research focuses on Muslims and Muslim nationalism in British India. And uh, we will hear from Professor Martin Evans. Professor uh, Evans is professor of history at the University of Sussex. He is an expert on the history of empires with a focus on the French empire, modern Algeria and Morocco. Um, so the, the, the speakers will, will talk for 10, 
15. I mean, feel free to go <laughs> over the limit since we have uh, one, one less speaker. And then we'll have about 30 minutes for uh, questions, to take questions from the audience. Um, and yes, I know, um, Arthur, sorry, I mean, I, I know you were supposed to chair that session, so feel free to come in whenever you, you feel like it. Um, so, Professor Belkacem Belmeki. Yes, hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Yeah, hello, yes. we can hear you. Okay, good. Hello, everybody. Thank you very, very much for this kind invitation to this very interesting um, conference. Uh, so the title of my presentation is uh, The Indelible Imprint of French Colonialism in Post-Independence Algeria. And so through this presentation, I would like to offer a glimpse or an overview of the peculiar nature of French colonialism in Algeria by focusing on the long lasting impact that this system had on this North African nation and its people. Now, the central argument I would like to stress here is that uh, Algeria's colonial experience in the past century had on the one hand significantly shaped Algerian attitude towards France after independence, and on the other, significantly shaped Algeria, sorry, uh, uh, predetermined the quality of political relationship between Algeria and France up to the present. So this year, Algeria marks the 60th anniversary of its independence from French colonialism. For today's Algerian youth, despite being preoccupied with much more urgent socioeconomic concerns, such as unemployment and low living standards, the country's colonial past still holds a special place in their hearts and minds. The very mention of Algeria's struggle for independence evokes images of torture and ruthless repression that were inflicted on the Mujahideen, that is freedom fighters, as well as ordinary civilians alike, who were uh, made to suffer indiscriminately. And surprisingly, France's colonial heavy handedness in Algeria had a long lasting impact on the nature of relations between both countries, which can be best described as very complicated and at times difficult. This fact is to a great extent compounded by the adamant refusal of the successive French governments to apologize for their country's bloody past in Algeria. Added to this highly sensitive issue is also the existence of other persistent issues unlikely to be solved, at least in the foreseeable future. And here I would like to mention two of these issues. First, the issue of Harkis. Now, Harki is a term in Arabic, denote, sorry, is a term in Algerian Arabic denoting any Algerian who had collaborated with the French during their presence in Algeria. Now, these Harkis, through much lobbying and exerting great deal, great deal of, ex, of pressure on the French government, seek a return to their home country, Algeria. However, all their efforts have hitherto reached a dead end because, for, ob for obvious reasons, neither the Algerian authorities nor the Algerian people in general seem ready to accept those who they still regard as traitors to the nation. The other thorny issue of equal importance is the one related to the archives of the revolution. The successive French governments have been so far reluctant to give the archives of a dreadful oppression of the Algerian people back to the former victims' representatives, that is the Algerian government, who, is, who, uh, who claimed their historical ownership as well. This French intransigence remains a serious stumbling block in the Franco-Algerian relations. Algerians today hold mixed feelings towards France. Images of horrendous sufferings endured by their parents and grandparents, transmitted through films, documentaries, history textbooks at schools, and even orally by those who had lived the moment, are all reminders that have shaped the Algerian mindset throughout the decades after independence. Indeed, 
anti-French sentiment felt by many Algerians today can be construed as a logical and expected post-colonial reaction due to the huge amount of hatred and unrestrained violence that was displayed by the French in the country from the beginning of colonization to the end. As remarked by Raymond Rudolph in his book, The Myth of France, quote, the mind of Bujot himself was the mind of such generals as Salon and Massu, end of quote. This quotation summarizes exactly the very nature of French colonialism in Algeria. Bujot was a 19th century French general who got credit for having mercilessly repressed early Algerian popular resistance to French conquest. His name is very often associated with such cruel methods as the scorched earth policy and les enfumades, that is the cruel annihilation of whole villages. Salon and Massu, meanwhile, were 20th century French generals of equal notoriety. These did not hesitate to resort to the systematic use of Gestapo-like methods of interrogation in their campaign to quell Algeria's liberation revolution. Curiously enough, some Algerians ascribe many of Algeria's ills today to French rule more than half a century ago. Though to an ordinary observer, this may seem quite unreasonable, there is a grain of truth in it. A good example could be the MAC movement, Mouvement pour l'autodétermination de la Kabylie, an extremist movement whose members claim the separatism of Kabylia from Algeria. Despite being, over, being rejected by the overwhelming majority of Algerians, including many Kabyles themselves, this movement remains a nuisance, struggling, though unsuccessfully, to sow division in the country. Its inspiration is nothing but a colonial legacy resulting from the French attempt to control the Algerian people through the David Tempera policy. Here, I would like to open a little bracket and mention uh, the fact that the MAC movement is sheltered by France and its members enjoy full protection uh, provided by the French authorities. This is a very important point. Um, talking about the divide and rule policy that the French adopted during their presence in Algeria, it is worthwhile to mention the fact that in studying the Algerian society in the 19th century, French ethnographers and anthropologists and even historians sought to create a false dichotomy implying the existence of sharp differences between the Arabs and Kabyles. In line with such a presumption, the Arabs were depicted in negative terms as lazy and trustworthy, backward, etc., and above all, as naturally and receptive of Western ideas, as opposed to the Kabyles, who were depicted in positive terms as industrious, reliable, etc. The ultimate purpose behind this idea was eventually to drive a wedge between the Algerian people, but also to win over the Kabyles to the French side and gain their collaboration. It's interesting to note that these scholars were graduates from the Grandes Écoles, such as l'École Polytechnique, and that such Grandes Écoles, which were founded by the end of the 18th century, were originally military schools. In other words, these scholars, these ethnographers, these anthropologists, historians, etc., were also military people, and their subjective study of the Algerian society was deliberately tailored to tally with the aims of the colonial project in Algeria. In this regard, Patricia Lorsin has contributed an interesting book on this subject in which she refers to, she refers, sorry, to the Le Mythe Kabyle, the Kabyle myth, as purely colonial creation. She describes how French scholars who had accompanied the occupation of Algeria sought to highlight or rather overplay the sociological differences between the Arabs and Kabyles, which they intentionally manipulated so as to support their thesis of the superiority of the Kabyles to the Arabs. 
describing the former as having a secular lifestyle and European-like mores and social behavior, rendering them more likely to be converted to Christianity and therefore more eligible for assimilation. For instance, Patricia Lorsen at some point mentioned the case of the French scholar, Edouard Lapin, who was simultaneously a lieutenant colonel in the French army, who sought to establish in his book, 26 mois à Bougie, a link between the Qabail, the Kabyle, and the Germanic tribes, stating that they had strikingly similar customs. By the way, the, this book, uh, 26 mois à Bougie, was the first book ever written by French on Algeria in French language. Uh, well, so to put it all in a nutshell, French rule in Algeria was by all accounts one of the harshest colonial systems that contemporary history has ever recorded. It would be no exaggeration to contend that French colonialism left a deep scar on the psyche of the Algerian people, even among post-independence generations. This is why 60 years on, Algeria is still defined by its anti-colonial struggle, both at the popular and official levels. Anti-French sentiment among many Algerian youth today can only be said to be a justified post-colonial reaction. At the official level, anti-French attitude can be illustrated by the fact that Algeria, which is among the most French-speaking nations in the world, has so far turned its back on the Francophonie organization, which was set up by France back in 1917, imitation of British Commonwealth. And, and instead, Algerian, the Algerian government officially applied to join the Commonwealth organization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Belmeki. Uh, I'm just now going to give uh, the floor to Professor Martin Evans, so whenever you're ready. Of course. First of all, um, just to say thank you to the organisers for um, inviting me for this uh, event, celebrating or commemorating and thinking about the 60th anniversary of uh, Algerian independence. Um, what I'm going to talk about really is, the, is an issue really of a continuity between the anti-colonial struggle of uh, the Algerian people and how this then led into a post-colonial anti-imperialist culture that was really integral to Algeria in the 1960s and 1970s. So really I'm going to talk about how Algeria becomes a centre of global anti-imperialism. Indeed, I would argue the centre of global anti-imperialism in the 1960s and 1970s. And in particular, I'm going to talk quite a lot about one remarkable event, which was the Pan-African Festival in Algiers in July 1969, which just lasted for just over a week. This was an act of political and cultural anti-colonialism and decolonization. It really underlined how Algeria and Algiers had become a focus of anti-imperialist forces across the globe. So the way in which she became a magnet of support for anti-imperialists in Latin America, Africa, and uh, in Asia. But in particular, it seems to me that what we saw in the Pan-African Festival is a form of cultural expression, which by centering Africa at the center of this event was a response to Western colonial, uh, colonial narratives. So this part of the energy of this of this of this uh, remarkable event was captured by the American photographer and filmmaker William Klein, a kind of remarkable document capt of capturing the energy and revolutionary intent of the globalist imperialist moment that we witnessed in Algiers in uh, 19, uh, 1969. And um, yes, we'll show the clip now. So this is some of the amazing visuals from um, the Pan-African Festival. So that's the fest visuals for the William Klein film. And then for the, whole, uh, uh, for the whole festival, which I'll come back to talk about. And this has already been, been emphasised, this, this remarkable quote from Cabral about the Pan-African Festival. 
the idea of pick up a pen and take note. Muslims going on make a pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, Christians to the Vatican, but national liberation movements to Algiers. I think that's a really important thing to understand, that both under Ben Bella and Boumediene, Algeria wasn't necessarily a very, very rich country, but they devoted a huge amount of national resources to the continuation of decolonial struggles, particularly around in South Africa, and in particular around the end of the uh, of the of the uh, of the Portuguese of the Portuguese Empire. One of the remarkable kind of moments in this um, festival was actually a performance by Archie Shep. So Archie Shep was a free form uh, uh, African, uh, sorry, American, African American uh, 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 jazz musician, and through free form jazz was specifically trying to, in a sense, challenge those jazz musicians who really still centered jazz or saw jazz within a kind of um, classical tradition. So very much centering jazz within within Africa. And it's a very, very remarkable concert, which really brings him together with a series of Tuareg musicians who are actually playing Ganawa music. Ganawa music, uh, 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 which in a way is a kind of symbol of the complex relationship between North Africa and uh, South Africa. And um, what I want to do now is just show us a sort of short clip from the film that will really give you a sense of the kind of revolutionary anti-colonial internationalism which was on display within the uh, within the conference. I think what was remarkable about that clip was the way in which um, the American poet Ted Jonas and Archie Shett were self-consciously trying to uh, connect um, the uh, uh, American Black American civil rights movement with Algeria. So the way in which decolonization and the civil rights movement and the black rights movement in America was seen to be one and uh, uh, one and uh, uh, the same the same thing. This is the kind of um, remarkable kind of like record that came out of that, and. In a sense, I think it's really um, the way in which <clears throat> the Pan-African Conference in 1969 needs to be situated within uh, wider uh, 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 political uh, imaginaries. So in a sense, the first Pan-African Conference is in London in 1900 with W.D. Du Bois confronting issues of racism and of um, uh, uh, self-determination for the Caribbean and Africa. Um, promoting a transnational concept, Pan-Africanism is a key idea of the 20th century. So you have subsequent conferences in Paris in 1919, London in 1921 and 23, New York in 1927 and Manchester in 1945. One thing that I would really underline about Manchester is that that obviously took place in the autumn of 1945 and there, there were uh, motions of solidarity both with Morocco and in particular Algeria because of the huge repression that had taken place uh, in Algeria in May and June uh, 19, uh, 1940, uh, 1945. We also have Pan-Arabism rooted in the Arab Renaissance during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Concepts of, of unification of the Arab world as a way of challenging European colonialism. And the apogee of this really under Colonel Nasser in Egypt during the 1950s and 1930s. And then the idea of the third world, an idea invented by the French demographer, Alfred Sovey in 1952. So he talked about the idea that, that at that point, everybody was obsessed or preoccupied with the Cold War, the idea of a confrontation between the first world and the second world. And he said, what this meant is that people were actually ignoring the most important uh, uh, event in national, international history, which was the emergence of the third world out of decolonization. And here, he made an explicit comparison with the idea of the third estate during the French Revolution. So the idea that the third world, like the third estate, is the majority. And I think here it's very, very important to underline the extent to which how Algeria became one of the leaders of the third world, uh, third world movement. And I think the, the fourth um, kind of uh, uh, international imaginary that I would underline would be the Non-Aligned Movement, which was launched in Bandung in Indonesia in April 1955. 
led by Egypt and Yugoslavia, and again, which passed motions in favour of Algerian, Tunisian and Moroccan self-determination. And again, after independence, Algeria took a key role in leading the, uh, uh, leading the uh, non-aligned movement. Now, in terms of after Algerian independence, it seems to me that across the globe, there were two ways in which really the idea of the Algerian revolution became absorbed at a wider level uh, 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 by anti-imperialists and by anti-racists. One would be the impact, the enormous impact of the writings of Franz Fanon, which are originally published in, in French, but then translated into English. And Fanon, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, his ideas, um, uh, born in Martinique, fights in World War II for the French, goes to mainland France to study in Lyon, but then goes to Algeria in 1953 as a psychiatric doctor and works in Bleeder. And there, in particular, one of the things that's remarkable about his experience in Algeria is through his work there, understanding that colonialism is not just an economic system, it's also a psychological, social and cultural system. So the way in which he's looking at, the way in which Algerians are made to feel consistently on a day-to-day -day level, second-class citizens and the effect that this has upon their uh, mental health. He then resigns in 1956 and joins the FLN as a journalist in Tunisia, he dies in 1961, but really um, the kind of two key books would be in 1959, published by Maspero, which is uh, year five of the Algerian Revolution, which is then published in English in the mid 60s as a dying colonialism with portraits or analysis of the Algerian Revolution. And then in 1961, the wretched of the earth, the idea that Algeria was at the vanguard of an African revolution, which was a global revolution. So his key ideas, colonialism as a system, the idea it's not just economic, but cultural and psychological, the necessity of violence as an overcoming of uh, 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 the kind of mirror, vi a mirror violence, the violence of colonialism, the idea that the third world is a new beginning, and Algeria is at the forefront of that, and a rejection of Europe. And the revolution based in Africa as an alternative to Marxism. And we see in Algeria after 1962, the way in which that becomes the center of a third world revolutionary culture. If we think about, for example, uh, uh, magazines like La Révolution, uh, La Révolution Africaine, and the way in which so many of the liberation movements, including the ANC, they have their bureaus and bases in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Algeria, in Algiers. The other thing that I would emphasize is obviously um, the remarkable film by Gillo Ponticorvo. Uh, some of that film draws upon the ideas of Franz Fanon in year five of the uh, Algerian Revolution. But the remarkable film, uh, The Battle of uh, Algiers. I still think, although there's been a huge amount of work on this, on this, on this uh, uh, film, but actually the impact that it has, for example, amongst black radicals within the United States. So for somebody like Archie Shep, this would have been his first understanding of the Algerian revolution would have been seeing this film. The same thing with the Black Panthers that come to Algiers in 1969. One of the first things they do is go to uh, the Casbah in Algiers and to pay homage to the place where Ali Lapointe is blown up. And they know about this through the film. So the radical uh, 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 anti-imperialist nature uh, of, uh, uh, of that film. And um, here, just to underline, uh, this is something that I'm involved with at the moment, which is um, a festival in Dublin in, in September uh, uh, 2022. So bringing together 100 years of Irish independence and 60 years of Algerian independence and bringing together Algerian creatives, photographers, filmmakers, performance artists, and thinking about their common histories. But in a sense, the kind of standout event from that will be the British Asian band, Asian Dub Foundation, will be doing a live score to the Battle of Algiers. They've only done this three times before. It's absolutely Astonishing, but the thing there for British people of 
Asian heritage, they see in this film and the way in which this film confronts colonialism and French colonialism, the idea that there is no equivalent in uh, Britain. So there you have the greatest film of all time with the greatest soundtrack, and they make it even better. So kind of the continuing radical implications of uh, that film that has an enormous kind of impact in the 1960s. And I think the other thing that I want to do is just to situate uh, the Pan-African Conference of 1969 was very much a reaction against uh, the um, uh, festival that was uh, took place in Dakar in Senegal in 1966, really under the under the sort of leadership of the of the uh, Senegalese president Leopold uh, Senghor. So this was um, the first uh, festival of Désir uh, Désir Negre and. It was very much Senghor and a group of Brat students from Africa and the Caribbean in Paris, very much influenced by the Harlem Renaissance in the USA, and they wanted an expression and a celebration of black culture. And for Senghor, it was about developing an equivalent for France's colonial uh, peoples, and very much the concept of negritude, the idea of a black identity based upon rhythm, spontaneity and emotion, and the antithesis of European rationalism. So the idea, and he says in 1939, emotion is black, just as reason as uh, is, is uh, Hellenic. And in a sense, Dakar in April 1966 is a kind of encapsulation of, uh, uh, of those ideas. A major international event, 30 independent countries, those with significant diasporas, so Britain, America, France, Haiti, Trinidad, Tobago, also, it's a moment of a kind of key moment in the civil rights movement in the USA and unfinished anti-colonial struggles, an emphasis on art, poetry, and music and dance. But what's really interesting in this festival is the idea is Africa does not include North Africa. So kind of very much that's a kind of very, very clear racial and poetic imaginary of negritude. And the liberation movements are not invited nor is uh, uh, James Baldwin. And I think that's really very, very important in terms of understanding the context for the Pan-African Festival of 1969. It's very much a reaction against 1966, which was accused of very vociferously of being neo-colonial, neo-colonial. Now, in terms of Algerian nationalism, um, very much as it emerged in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, one based upon Arab Islamic identity, and the idea of the war of one and a half million martyrs, which the ambassador spoke of at the introduction to the conference, means that post-62 Algeria has a huge place in legitimacy as a leader of the third world. We have the first president, Ahmed Ben Bella, supporting liberation movements and organizing a second Bandung conference. Um, he, as we know, is overthrown by Boumedien. That second uh, Bandun conference doesn't take place. But nevertheless, under Boumedien, there's a continuation of seeing Algeria really as a vanguard, as a country of a revolutionary leader in, in Africa. It plays a key role in the organisation of African unity. And in 1967, offers to host the Pan-African Festival. It is Bouteflika that she says this. That's because Algeria, because of petrol, has the resources to do that and shows the generosity that it wants to, wants to, wants to finance this. The festival, very much a reaction against uh, the, 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 the Dakar event, it includes the whole continent. It puts an emphasis on the liberation movements. It includes the Black Panthers who are now on the run from America and seek refuge in Algeria, but also the P Palestine Liberation Organization, which has been founded in 1964, very much inspired by the National Liberation Front in Algeria. Really, it's a kind of key moment in terms of launching the PLO as a, a, uh, uh, as a, as a kind of international idea. I would say that within the festival, there are kind of three spaces. So the spaces for intellectual discussions, 
There are spaces, uh, impromptu spaces in Algiers itself. And then as we saw with the Archie Shep concert, there is incredible music events that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that take place. It's kind of really remarkably captured in the film, this opening procession in Algiers with all these different uh, African liberation movements uh, processing through Algiers. So Senegal attacked as being neo-colonial. The event is about cultural decolonization. I think that's very, very interesting in terms of um, now decolonization being very much a contemporary theme, a contemporary idea, but actually that was something that was really prominent within this festival. And also new solidarities being forged through the festival, in particular between the Black Panthers and the, the PLO. And some of the people that performed, Nina Simone, Miri McCabe, and this is, I really recognize that, so it's the Rue Mouhati Douche in the center of Algiers. And this was the African American center, the Black Panthers, which was right next to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Simra Bureau for the, for the Palestinians. So that explains through that physical proximity, the kind of solidarities between, uh, between those two. And these are some of the posters that are produced. And of course, as we will know that, uh, Within, if you go to Algeria, solidarity with a Palestinian cause is a reflex action. And this is a moment really when that became, uh, 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 became anchored uh, within, the, uh, within the festival. I think really what I would say is that just as a way of conclusion is obviously the relationship between Algeria and Africa. It's a very, very complex history in terms of the relationship between North and Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's important for us to really escape or eschew any romanticization. There are problems and there are issues which are to do with legacies of the slave trade and racism which are present there. But I think what is really important in terms of the 1969 festival is that in the 1920s and 1930s, the kind of uh, the bedrock of Algerian nationalism was an Arab Islamic identity. Of course, solidarity over Ethiopia was very, very important, but it's really only after independence that Africa, as a kind of central part of Algeria, is uh, pushed to the fore. And in a sense here, the leading role that Algeria takes in the liberation of the continent, which as we saw earlier on, which is very, very true, the extent to which that was recognised by Nelson Mandela. When he returned to Algeria after, after his liberation in 1990, for him, that was a hugely symbolic moment, the role that the Algerian people had played in supporting the South Africans and the liberation of South Africa. Right, thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. So we have... Well, we don't have 30 minutes. I think we have like 20 or 25 minutes for questions. Oh, I'll just stop sharing. And uh, let me just put everyone on screen. Yeah, so we have about 20 to 25 minutes uh, for questions. Before I... No, ask the audience uh, for the questions. Let me just ask uh, Dr. Arthur Asiraf if he has any comment or any questions. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but of course I'm doing just that. Uh, <laughs> but you're, you're also the other expert on uh, colonial history. Yes, you are, uh, of, of Algeria. So if you have any question or comment, um, Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't um, be with all of you for a really important um, event, but it's a pleasure to see all of your faces and to hear these papers. Um, I, I don't have a, a great, but maybe just to get the conversation um, started. Uh, so this is obviously a really important um, anniversary and, and it's the Algerian revolution kind of remain something very important to think with for a lot of people. I guess I'm wondering um, to, to the two panelists, what, what, what have been some recent trends um, in, in how we understand this event? Uh, what have been some changes in research internationally, maybe on the more academic side, some new aspects that are being uh, explored 
or other shifts um, in the way in which uh, this, this history has been commemorated in the past, I don't know, 10 to 20 years in a way that it wasn't discussed um, uh, a longer time ago. I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that. That's just what I was. I think it might be interesting for an audience to know what the kind of hot topics are um, in current research. Professor Belmeki, do you want to come in or Professor Evans? Yeah, I can say something. Okay, Professor Evans. So thank you all for that's a big question. What are the hot topics? What are the hot topics in Algeria? I suppose I would say that maybe um, there would be just two things to think about, which I think is, um, in a sense, the paper that I was talking about in the 1960s and 1970s. I think it would be true to say then at that point that the FLN as a kind of idea, as a kind of entity, as a kind of, um, in terms of what it was seen to have achieved, had a huge prestige. And I think that one of the things there is obviously, I think, academically, the significance of the great book by Mohammed Harbi, which is published in 1980, which is um, uh, Mirage Reality, which was really trying to say that actually the FLN was not what, what a lot of revolutionaries thought about, thought it was, and talking about the authoritarianism of the, of the FLN. And I think that was a really key moment. And I think the way in which that really had a kind of long-term effect on the historiography, which is affected by events as well, I would underline in particular October 1988, where you see the kind of Algerian army firing on um, uh, Algerian protesters in Algiers. I suppose it's really moving away from a narrative which was focused upon the FLN and saw it in terms of a unified um, resistance movement. So much of the really important research, it seems to me, has been thinking about what about the role of, of other organisations, um, the Algerian Communist Party, um, there's the work of Malika Rahal, which has been talking about uh, the kind of uh, liberal Algerians. The work of Benjamin Storr recovering the central role of Masali Hajj as somebody who is absolutely crucial in terms of the history of Algerian nationalism. So I think one thing there would be, would be maybe pluralism. I think the other thing is, is really possibly thinking about Algeria in a kind of um, comparative and a connected uh, context. So I think there's a kind of way in which you're trying to think about Algeria in a much broader, broader sense. So opening, opening up conversations with historians working on, on colonialism uh, elsewhere, whether it be um, in the context of what we're trying to do, albeit with a cultural festival in Dublin in September, that is about opening up a conversation between Ireland and Algeria. It's actually really interesting the kind of points of commonality between those two histories. Masali Hajj, at the end of the 1920s, would say that Ireland was a key inspiration for Algerians because Ireland, in its fight against British colonialism, there were two issues, land and religious identity. So I think there about the, about, about the connections. And there, similarly, although I've talked about um, the kind of interconnected histories between Algerians and Palestinians, who actually has done the research on this. It's talked about as an emotive subject, but that would be something that would be really interesting to explore. So I think those would be two things. I don't know if that answers your question, Arthur, in terms of what are the hot topics. Thank you. Um, I think we have a few, a couple there's of a, questions. There's also a hand from Ida. Uh, from Ida. Yeah. Yes, hi. So uh, I just want to pick up the idea of, um, of of Algeria not being part of Africa, which is which is uh, which is quite historical, um, as as you mentioned. So now, just thinking of what Masrui has talked about, you know, the the triple heritage of uh, sort of like people, uh, some people in in Africa. What is the thought of young Algerians now? Um, are they thinking that they could be? part of this triple heritage or, or do they think they're also part of uh, 
Mediterranean and the Roman Empire. I don't know. What, what, what's the thought of the young people now? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's probably a question for someone who's in Algeria, right? So <laughs> maybe uh, Professor Bermeki, you might yeah. <laughs> have a better well, idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, we always consider ourselves as Africans, as North Africans, but we do, we feel that we do share so much with uh, the African continent. We feel that we belong to this continent. And, and, and um, Algeria's struggle uh, for independence is, uh, still remains uh, like uh, uh, other uh, peoples, African peoples, right? It's still something of the hour, it's a topic of the hour. And this is reflected in, in um, uh, you know, the behavior of people who, for example, they have a tendency to reject French language, right? And I think there is a similar thing taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa. Many Africans want to reject French influence. And, and uh, uh, Algeria, of course, well, there is also something that happened. Actually, these days, Algeria is hosting the Mediterranean, the, uh, Mediterranean Games. Uh, and, and these are taking place in my home city of, of Oran. Uh, I'll tell you something that happened, which is uh, symbolic, but which has, you know, big significance. Um, when the, uh, the delegations of, of um, national uh, during this the opening ceremony, when delegations were coming out, you know, um, holding their flags, and uh, um, there was the Spanish delegation, the uh, uh, the Greek delegation, the Egyptian, etc. So they were cheered by people, by young people, because the stadium was mostly filled by young people. And when the French delegation was coming out, people started whistling. Well, this is very symbolic, but it means a lot. It means a rejection of French uh, influence, right? And and the French, you know, and 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 it's the same thing is taking place, I think, in 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 in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in Mali, where people are demonstrating perhaps on daily basis. This is not something that is said in the media. I think it's it's kind of stifled. But many peoples, African peoples, want to get rid of this French, uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Right, so we, we're going to take some questions from the audience and then we'll come back. I know there's a couple of questions from the people online. I know someone has their hand raised, but we'll, I'll come back to you. Promise. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I appreciate your uh, conference. Just two things. First, uh, after I think 1959, Algeria start or 60, Algeria start to open uh, embassies in Africa. Fanon was the ambassador of Algeria in Accra, in Ghana. First, the second is uh, Algerian Revolution also opened the front of Mali. It was the front of Mali in 1960. And also, as you know, Mandela started his uh, military or his training in, in Algeria in 1960. One, I think. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Do you want me to, to respond? Uh, what's the early questions about, about Algerian identity? Um, sh shall I take questions from um, online? I'm, I'm a bit confused. That wasn't a question, right? No, that was just a comment. Okay. I mean, I, I agree with you, obviously. Um, um, Totally. And one of the people that's speaking in Dublin is Elaine McTuffey. And um, she, of course, was with Frantz Fanon in, um, in, in Accra. Uh, they were very worried one night because they went out dancing and they sort of forgot that they started smoking French galois, when actually, of course, galois cigarettes were banned if you were kind of in the Algerian liberation movement because they were, uh, they were French. I think it's more about, um, it's, it's interesting looking at the history of Algerian nationalism in the 1920s and 1930s. It's very much about Pan-Arabism. The Pan-African dimension, from what I've looked at, is not necessarily there, although, of course, Algerian, Moroccan, Tunisian uh, activists would have would have met them in in Paris in the nineteen in the in the nineteen thirties when that's kind of pub of anti colonialism. But I think it's very very noticeable in the sixties when that comes to be really at the forefront of an Algerian political imaginary, which then really is exemplified by the the kind of Pan African festival, which 
I mean, it's amazing actually how little research has been done on that. That is still awaiting its historian in terms of that moment. Um, there's a remarkable work that's been done by the Algerian artist Zineb Sidira around 69, but that is still really a moment that's kind of really open for historical, historical research. In terms of, um, obviously, I'm not Algerian. Um, all I can say is that, and please don't laugh, I do box twice a week uh, with somebody who is Algerian who says that I actually box like an Algerian. I don't. I always take that as a compliment. But uh, I think um, I would say one of the things that strikes me about the Maghreb is the way in which it's really a kind of it's a four, it's a kind of crossroads. So you've got the Mediterranean aspect, you've got the uh, African aspect. You've obviously got the impact of Arab culture and French culture, French culture. Uh, and obviously you've got the Amazir culture as well. And I think that's very, very important. One of the things I'm very proud of at Sussex is that we have a centre for Middle East and North African studies. The Maghreb is not the Middle East. It is different. And that's obviously one of the things that's a danger in Britain that so much of the research that's done in the Maghreb is done within Middle East uh, 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 departments. I think that that means that we can lose the specificity of what is the uh, of the of the of the Maghreb. Yes, thank you. Right, so I'm going to take some questions from the uh, online audience. Uh, uh, Wada Ben Musa, you've had your your hand, sorry, <laughs> up for a while. I, I apologize. Uh, do you still have a question? Do you still want to come in? No. Uh, oh, sorry. You need to. Oh, you need to give them permission to speak. Okay. Um, Wada, I think you can now speak. You should be able to um, to speak. No. Uh, maybe we can take one of the uh, one of the questions in the uh, in the Q and A. So there's a question from Savita Vij. Uh, hello, I had a question about the idea of the term third world being coined by Alfred Sovi. However, terms like this have been so loaded and racialized and far from neutral and celebratory. As we commemorate, do we need to critically reflect on some of the uh, of some of the origin of these terms? I don't know who that is meant for, but is anyone <laughs> is anyone able to answer that? It's a, com it's a complicated question, I think. Yeah. I mean, that's a really complicated question. I think what I was trying to do was to try to precisely situate how the term first emerged. I think in Alfred Sobey's eyes, it was about raising a question of the majority world and saying that this is the majority. What does the majority want from the 1950s onwards? I mean, obviously, third world as a concept has been extensively criticised, the extent to which we can see or reduce the experiences of Latin America, Africa, and Asia into one. We can't. We can't. Um, I suppose, interestingly enough, it was used a lot in terms of understanding Gilo Ponte Gulbo is the back of Algiers, greatest film of all time, greatest soundtrack of all time. But in terms of that, as an example of third cinema, the kind of third perspective. So I think. What I was trying to do as a historian was try to briefly, but you know, to actually try and contextualize and historicize that term, which I fully recognize is, is absolutely problematic. Okay, thank you. Arthur, I saw that you had your hand raised. Do you still want to come in? Oh, sorry, I don't need to. It's just um I think it the term was there was a really important moment of organization and solidarity around that term, and that previously as as Martin has been pointing out, a lot of uh, anti-colonial activity was specific to one continent. So there was Pan-Asianism, or you might have Pan-African conferences, and it is around the term third world in, in the 1950s and 60s in particular, that you see a lot of global organizing against uh, imperialism. So that term doesn't really work for us now, but it's you, you can't just put it aside because it was very important for people at the time as a way of organizing um, their struggles. I also just want to say very quickly, based on the previous question, that I think it is important and slightly uncomfortable to recognize that there is significant anti-Black racism in Algeria. 
just like in every other country. I mean, it's not exceptional to, to Algeria or to North African countries, but it is also part of how that society operates and that sometimes makes um, relations with other regions in Africa um, complicated, particularly when it comes to migrants within Algeria. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for uh, adding this, Arthur. Um, so we have, okay, we have a question in the audience. So we'll go to the audience here and then I'll come back to the audience online. Hi, yes. thank you so much. Um, I wondered if you could talk about how successful by any metric the Pan-African Festival was um, in achieving its own aims. And one way that I would probably think about it is that if there was another iteration today, would we still be able to have that kind of gravitas and sense of solidarity? Like, you know, what has happened to the Black Panthers? What's happened to the PLO? Um, you know, is there unity or has everything, or, you know, has imperialism won, in fact? Mm. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. I think I'd say two things maybe about it, and it's really connecting with what Arthur said, which I think is really important. Um, I've been involved doing a kind of really interesting project. Well, sorry, I think it's interesting, which is really comparing rhyme music with reggae music in terms of protest cultures. And uh, there's a great film done by a French director called Martin Mazonnier, where he actually brought together kind of... Um, reggae musicians with um, uh, Algerian rhyme musicians like Chub Khaled to kind of uh, exchange and play. The reason I say that is that, of course, in the 1960s, you had, sorry, in the 1970s, you had a movement within Jamaica that saw itself as, as kind of a global anti-imperialist third worldist um, uh, attempting to kind of uh, uh, elucidate a third worldist alternative. I think those are the kinds of connections and solidarities that you saw developing around third worldism which had a very positive kind of content and, and, and intent. In terms of, of sort of, I know that, that in 2009, the Algerian government kind of did a kind of modern day version of, of the kind of Pan-African festival, which had some great musicians that were involved like Chef Khaled, but I mean, really had very, very little kind of, kind of impact. And I think that one of the, I suppose, one of the original organizers said that this was an example of something which had lots of, you know, beaucoup de ressources, mais peu de sens. But in 1969, peu de ressources, mais beaucoup de sens. And I think that's really important. That 69, I think, really captured a very, very important moment of, 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 of optimism. And I still think that the histories of all this are really to be written because I think one of the things that's really striking about the 1960s is the extent to which many of the talented third world leaders, you know, die or assassinate in dubious circumstances. I mean, here, so I don't want to break a taboo here by mentioning a Moroccan, but let's mention Mehdi Ben Barker. Mehdi Ben Barker, who was inspired by the Algerian revolution and saw a very, very close connection around pan-Maghreb solidarities between Algerians and Moroccans in the 1960s. Well, of course, as we know, he dies in extremely dubious circumstances in 1965. And here's a number of those examples. I think there, that's something that's still a history to be written in terms of, of that kind of, um, uh, 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 kind of, not without its problems. I think that Mehdi Ben Barker was, in many respects, quite authoritarian. But in a sense, that vision that he had, which are very much foreground in the Palestinian struggle, within this kind of pre-continental struggle. You know, he was organizing before he was assassinated a huge conference in, uh, in Havana. So I think that history is really still there to be, to be, to be recovered in all of its complexities. We don't want to romanticize it by any, by any means, but I think, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's kind of trying to think about how you situate 69 within this broader, broader kind of um, history and culture, which I still think is there still really to be written. Thank you. Oh, shall I take another? Can can I take a question from online? Because I think someone had the, um, Elise Mazurier. Do you want to come in? Sorry, people have been waiting a while online no, no, to ask right. their questions. So some of them probably gave up. Does it work now, Elise? 
Uh, yeah, I think it's working. Thank you. Yes, we can um, hear. Thank you very much for um, both presentations, and I uh, have questions for both speakers. So, first for Professor Balmeki, my um, questions was um, whether you could um, maybe draw a short picture um, comparing uh, the way the the French authorities framed this image of the Kabyle population and also in comparison with the Berber population and across um, Morocco and, um, and Algeria. And if what were the differences um, of the French policy depending if it was a protectorate or a department and especially what was the impact of the um, the the military theories um, in the way in which those uh, populations were recruited differently, maybe in in the army. Um, and then I had um, a question uh, for Professor Evans comparing um, con uh, concerning um, the Panaf uh, uh, Pan African festival, and if there had been um, during this festival. Any and also through the exchanges that it enabled and the spaces of um, encountering between uh, African American activists and um, decolonization activists in recently decolonized states uh, societies, if there had been any comparison concerning both the uh, theory of colonialism applied to the uh, North African uh, framework and uh, to the British and French empires, but also to the um, um, participation both um, of ethnic minorities from the US and Canada and from the colonized territories of British and French empires to uh, World War I and World War II and the continuation of this participation into um, the occupation of Germany after World War II and also participation uh, until the decolonization wars because um, also I was wondering if the exchanges lasted after the Pan-African Festival and what was the insight of those different activist groups um, on the... Sorry, on the... Um, the Vietnam War and in the way how the um, um, USA um, waged uh, a war um, in a recently decolonized uh, part of the French Empire um, some decades after the Indochina War. Thank you. Sorry, before you answer, can I ask the, the answers to be brief? Because we're kind of running out of time and we have a lot of people who want to ask questions also online and here in the audience. And I would like to give everyone the opportunity to uh, to ask their question. Thank you. Um, uh, I think the first question was, was for it? Professor Belmeki. Yes. Okay. So just briefly, um, I would like to say that... Um, we cannot compare Algeria with Morocco. I mean, they did not have the same colonial experience. Algeria, in Algeria, there was a settler, settler colonialism, that is, which uh, sought to um, eliminate the um, indigenous population and its culture and replace it by a settler colony, which was brought from uh, southern parts of Europe, from France, Malta, Spain, and Italy, right? And uh, so, um, and Algeria was was annexed as a French department. Well, I mean, as three French departments: Le Constantinois, Lorani, and uh, and and l'Algérois. Morocco was a different story. In Morocco, you know, they had, um, you know, Morocco became a protectorate, right? Now, in Algeria, uh, the uh, the first thing the uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the French sought to do was to divide the Algerians, and they saw they wanted to exploit the opportunity of the Kabyles as being slightly different from the Arabs, I mean, in, 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 to a certain extent, right? And they wanted to play around that, okay? But in the end, it was total failure, right? In the end, it was a total failure. And um, 
that's it. So uh, the divide and rule was 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 their uh, their their um, you know their objective from the beginning because they wanted to uh, have a um, uh, the collaboration of the Kabyles in order to be able to subjugate Algeria quickly. Thank you. Yeah. And now your question, Professor Evans. Um. Um. I think, yes, I mean, clearly there was a kind of connection between, um, I mean, the Black Panthers, the importance of France Fanon, but also the cultural impact of the Battle of Algiers in those circles in America was was uh, was enormous. I mean, I know uh, one Black Panther uh, militant who was imprisoned uh, and at his trial, one of the accusations was that they'd been using the Battle of Algiers as a kind of like, you know, kind of military strategy film in a way that shows how you could kind of conduct urban guerrilla warfare in um, in the United States. So I think there in terms of those, those connections, I think one of the things that I would say, this is a kind of roundabout way of answering it. So I'm involved in a project at Sussex called Black at Sussex, where... Um, Part of that is, is uh, working with a photographer, somebody called Charlie Phillips, who's arrived um, in the mid-1950s uh, from Jamaica and started taking photographs around Notting Hill and uh, around um, sort of uh, Soho jazz clubs. He's, um, there's a great series um, on the BBC at the moment, The Art That Made Us, which talks about Charlie Phillips as being one of the most significant artists in, uh, in, in Britain today. And um, he's involved in a project with another photographer, Eddie Achair, where he's photographing black alumni from Sussex. So it's kind of really interesting. So the person that wrote um, the pamphlet, which was about how the British education system was failing West Indians, Bernard Cord, was also leader of the Grenadian Revolution, was a student at Sussex. Paul Gilroy, who wrote Ain't No Black and Union Jack, was a student at Sussex. But also one of the people was Len Garrison. Len Garrison founded the Black Cultural Archives in Brixton. If any of you, if you've not been there, I really recommend that you go. It's a kind of astonishing archive around Black British history. But as a student in the mid-1970s at Sussex, Garrison, who was studying in the School of African and Asian Studies at, at Sussex, founded a review called the Afras Review. It's astonishing to read it. I mean, he actually interviewed people like C.R. James, Walter Rodney. But in that kind of sort of um, journal, what you see is this relationship that Len Garrison sees the struggle of black people within Britain absolutely within this anti-imperialist, third-worldist kind of um, uh, perspective. So I think those kind of, uh, that impact of... Um, of Algeria via people like Fanon, who's translated into English, enormous impact on uh, uh, black British kind of activists in the 1780s. You kind of like see that. So it's kind of really through the work of, of Len Garrison, absolutely kind of um, um, uh, uh, remarkable. I suppose the other thing I would say, I mean, it shows how stupid I am because I didn't really realise until I was teaching this kind of course about three or four years ago. And it's such an obvious point that C.R.R. James the kind of Trinidad Trotsky is going to Paris in the mid-1930s to write the Black Jacobins. And that for him, the Black Jacobins, the idea that Haiti is the first successful slave revolt, is an inspiration to global anti-colonialists and anti-imperialists everywhere. So in a way, we do see these connections that are emerging already in the 20s and 30s between different global networks that are really important and are still very much unexplored. Thank you. So I think there was a question here from the audience. Yeah, it was a question for Dr. or Professor Bukemi. Um, and before I start, I just want to thank um, Professor Evans as well, because your work was really helpful during my undergrad uh, degree to um, access Algerian Anglophone sources, so especially Algeria's, um, sorry, France's undeclared war. So that was really great to hear you speak just then. Um, so for Dr. Belkemi, I wanted to just touch on the fact that you said there's two points um, that you know, create hostility amongst Algerians today. The first being, um, especially towards France, the first being um, Harkis, and the second being France's inability to apologize for um, colonization. But I just wanted to add, do you not think the fact that France continues to use um, colonial 
methods on their post-colonial communities today is something that also creates hostility. I did my um, undergrad dissertation on the effect of COVID on post-colonial communities and I found that a lot of the colonial methods that were used in Algeria are actually still being used on Algerians in France today Um, and so I just wanted to know if you could comment on that um, and just add if it's something that you think is also creating that tension. Yes, thank you very much for this point. Actually, the problem is in the mentality of the French. And uh, there is a serious problem there, um, uh, which is the fact that on daily grounds, you can see the French media and also um, uh, revengeful former colonizer communities, right? Who engage in um, Algeria bashing, right? Uh, The only thing that we understand is that these uh, French um, are, uh, uh, find it really very difficult to, to come to terms with the fact that Algeria is an, indi- is an independent nation. And that's a serious problem. And there are people who are highly placed in French state, right, who still have that mentality. And as long as that mentality continues, we'll always have uh, such murky relations between Algeria and France. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and this is just anecdotal, so evidence. But in 1991, I drove with um, three Algerian friends, so it's two Algerian women and an Algerian guy, um, from Paris to Marseille to take the boat to Algiers. And I'd say it's really interesting, the people that stop you and think what you're up to. So the number of times that we were stopped by the, uh, by the police. Um, so we actually used to get it as a routine that we'd show the passports and I'd be the last person to show the passport, the British passport. And that really created a reaction to a French police. One person actually said to me, a French policeman, I said, so you're the pimp, are you? <laughs> okay, sorry. I, I'm, 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 obviously, I'm... I was not the pimp, so that was, but that was the pimp. <laughs> Sorry, that um, that left me speechless. <laughs> I needed a few seconds to recover, but I'm fine now. I, there's a question online uh, that might be slightly related to, to, to this last question. Uh, it's from Mael Amrun. Uh, do you see a difference in trends of scholarships? It has to do with scholarship. Do you see a difference in trends of scholarship within Algeria or perhaps Africa more broadly versus scholarship in the Anglophone world in terms of interest or priorities or frameworks? So either, either speaker. I can see Arthur nodding. No. <laughs> Very interesting uh, question. Yes. Sorry, Arthur, please, yeah? <laughs> no, no, it's... All right. Um, I think one thing that's interesting is... Um, um, I mean, I'm not sure this is necessarily the answer, but I was involved in curating an exhibition comparing Paris and London between the mid-1950s and the mid-1990s in terms of how both cities have been transformed by global migration, but in particular the role of music in anti-racism. And that's how we began the whole thing about comparing reggae and rye. But one of the things that was very interesting within France is actually really suspicion towards the term post-colonial. Um, even in a very, very basic level, the idea that post-colonial means or is, is, is in, intimating that somehow we're beyond colonialism or colonialism is somehow ended. And I was really quite struck by that, the extent to which there was a, within meeting to kind of lots of explanations is actually a sort of idea that post-colonialism is obviously about the after effects of of empire and understanding that complex relationships between kind of um, past and present. So that's just one real comment about kind of um, the differences. And I suppose there, in terms of it striking, I think the extent to which um, within France and Algeria, a lot of the ways in which knowledge is organised at a university level is you still see the continuation of an influence of the kind of French system is very obvious. Um, that's just a comment. I'm not sure I'm really answering anything. Thank you. We have uh, Zinedine Swalmi online who has their hand raised. Um, Let me just give you permission to speak. Zinedine, 
Do you want to come in? Uh, hello. Hello. Can yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for uh, well hosting this this event. Uh, well, my question actually I had uh, asked it uh, on the chat box, but I'll just uh, I'll just say it again. Um, well, we talked about uh, Algeria's past uh, for uh, this whole conference, and I was wondering uh, what our panelists think uh, lies ahead for Algeria. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of, uh, well, uh, its implication in Africa, uh, in the Med Mediterranean Sea, in the Arab world. Uh, we can see, for example, that um, the government is investing in uh, building infrastructures to, um, to um, uh, well, to build more uh, economic integration, notably with Sub-Saharan Africa. So what do you think lies ahead for uh, Africa in the next, let's say, 60 years, since it's the 60 <laughs> years anniversary? Um, what, can I answer? Yes, sure, go ahead. Yes, okay. So I think Algeria has learned, Algeria is a young republic, you know, 60, year, 60 years old is, is, is young, you know, by international standards. But... Um, Algerian government has learned from its past mistakes, and now we can uh, see, uh, you know, mutations taking place in Algeria's, uh, you know, um, organized economic organization and etc. Fairly recently, Algerian government, um, you know, uh, changed its investment law rules uh, in order to encourage more investment coming from abroad. And also, Algeria has inter is refocusing its attention away from, well, away from France. Okay, now we have more partners uh, with Turkey, with Italy. Recently, Algeria signed a very, very important uh, strategic, uh, you know, um, uh, treaty with uh, with Italy, and that would encourage more, you know, exchange of uh, know-how of, um, um, you know, um, in in trade and etc. So I think, so I'm not uh, I'm not specialist in Algerian affairs, by the way, but as an Algerian scholar, I think Algeria is changing. Algeria is changing and the Algerian government has learned from its past mistakes. Now people are really serious, want to get things, you know, over because with the whole, with all the money that we, we have had in the past, right? And we, you know, we are, we haven't reached that level of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, where, you know, Algeria is, for example, sufficient in, in, in terms of uh, food, in terms of, of, of organization uh, in terms of whatever, you know. Now we have to, uh, uh, the, the Algerian government is changing and it's foc the focus is shifting away from, from France. This is as far as I know. Now, recently there was a decision by the, uh, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Education to introduce English in primary schools, right? And this is going to be at the expense of French. French is going to be relegated to you know third place or well this is my my uh, viewpoint thank you yeah um i mean that's a really interesting question and part of the focus of um the event in dublin is thinking about algerian futures algerian futures and we're gonna have a similar event at sussex um hopefully around the Brighton Film Festival in, in November. So thinking about futures, what are the futures for, for Algeria? I think one thing that I would say is that um, in the event in Dublin, I think it's going to open up questions through comparison. So if we think about Ireland 40 years ago, how many people in Britain would have perceived Ireland in terms of its stance over divorce, marriage, gay rights, and the way in which that has changed over the last 40 years. And the way I think it's going to be really interesting to have that conversation, to think about the ways in which Algeria could change over the next 40 years by making that kind of, kind of comparison. So I think that's what I would say in terms of thinking about Algerian futures through, uh, uh, through, a, kind of, um, through a kind of comparative perspective. Thank, Thank you. you. 
So I thank you. I, I, I can see there's a couple more questions um, uh, in the chat, but I think we really need to move on because we're, 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 I mean, even by Algerian standards, <laughs> we're, we're late. <laughs> so I think we need to move on. Um, and if we have time in, in, the, in the second panel, maybe we can come back to those questions. So I would like to thank you, our two speakers, Professor Belmeki and Professor Evans. Um, thank you for your very interesting presentations. And thank you to everyone in the audience for very great questions. Um, and thank you, Arthur, for participating Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. I think uh, we can we can start the second panel. Or should we have maybe a five minutes break? Um, yeah, let's let's have a five minutes break and then um, we'll have our second panel. So we, we'll start again at four thirty. Hello again. I think we're ready to start the second panel. So in this panel. We have uh, three speakers, two will be joining us online and one will be here with us um, at SOAS. We have Dr. Amel Yousfi, who is professor and senior researcher at the University of Tlemcen. And uh, Dr. Amel Yousfi works on historical and biological anthropology and archaeology. Uh, second, we will be listening to Dr. Amir Lebdawi, uh, who is a lecturer in political economy of development here at SOAS, and he has expertise in several key regions of the world, including Latin America, Africa, and the Arab world. And then finally, we'll be listening to Dr. Mekia Neja from the University of Orem, who has uh, expertise in international relations, conflict processes, and comparative politics. So um, Amel Yousfi will be talking about higher education in Algeria after independence, Achievements, Challenges, and Openness. Um, doctor, when you are ready, we are. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Miss, uh, Mrs. Uh, Aisha. You hear me? Yes, we can he hear you very well and we can see you as well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Very happy and glad to be with you to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the independence of Algeria. Uh, this day, this, uh, this uh, day is uh, very important for us. It is an event in our glorious history, the history of the nation, the history that one million and a half million of martyrs uh, made themselves for the liberation of our country. So, and thank you for, uh, for this kind invitation. So my uh, interven intervention this, in this meeting is about higher education in Algeria after independence, achievements, challenge, and openness. This intervention aims to highlight the main achievements and challenge of higher education system in Algeria across its evolution. The higher education and scientific research sector has witnessed a great development in recent years due to the state's interest in the sector uh, by increasing the numbers of the number of structures such as universities, institutes, laboratories, and scientific research centers. And this is within the system of reforming the sector to keep pace with the development touching various society, whether Arabic or Western. But before we start talking about higher education after independence, uh, let's uh, review uh, higher education in Algeria during the colonial period. This latter received a big attention, uh, I mean uh, the higher education in Algeria, received a big attention by the French authorities, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. But this type of education was in the interest of the French and the Europeans and the Algerians received just a little lack from it. At the beginning of the occupation, the French were sending their children to France to continue their university studies. University in Algiers was established in 1909, which remained the only university in North Africa until independence. It is a French university in its fullest, fullest sense of the word, and it has nothing from Algeria that's its name. 
Before 1962, in fact, the first beginning of the higher education in Algeria do not go back to the year of 1909, when the University of Algiers were found, nor to the law of the 20th of December 1878. 1879, which enacted the establishment of three higher schools for, for higher education. Rather, rather, its presence in Algeria goes back to the decree of 1857, according to which a preparatory school in medicine and pharmacy was established. However, the effort and steps of, to establish the school go back to a longer time. In 1849, the Institute of Medicine in Algeria took the initiative to establish higher education in the field of medicine, which, while there were only fifth primary and one secondary school in Algeria at that time, so effort, efforts were focused after the elimination of popular resistance, because in that period, we have many uh, popular resistance, uh, like uh, that of uh, Abdul Kader and Ahmed Bey, to develop primary and secondary school education. After the progress recorded in the field of primary and secondary education, uh, for the French, of course, the project to establish higher education in the medical field was renewed in 1854. But this project was not embellished in reality except by establishing a preparatory school in medicine and pharmacy in 1857. This school started its task with eight permanent professors and four temporary teachers. And this school also benefited from all the advantage guaranteed granted to the preparatory school of medicine in France. As for the law of December 1879, uh, the law of the 20th of December 1879, it is considered the first serious step in the field of education, as it stipulated the establishment of these schools for higher education, arts, law, and science. The aim of establishing higher education in Algeria, especially in the field of medicine, was to serve colonial interests. But this, by this way, declared the French minister at that period, in uh, 1854, uh, the Salvondi, the Salvondi declared that if we occupied Algeria with war, we would preserve it with civilization. The Arab race can only be controlled by religion or medicine. So if religion uh, separates us, medicine brings us closer. That was declared the Salvandi. After, 16, after 1962 and until 1969, this stage was marked by the establishment of many universities in Algeria city starting with the University of Oran in 1966, and then the University of Constantine in 1967. So at the University of Algiers, it includes four faculties, 19 institutes, three centers, four high schools, and an astronomical observatory. For Oran, it, have, it had four faculties, the Faculty of Law and the Economic, Science, the Faculty of Art, the Faculty of Science, and the Faculty of Medicine. At Constantine was home of the, to the National School of Medicine and the Science Institute, the, the, Institute, the Institute of Legal Studies and Literary. Concerning the pedagogical system, it was identical at the time to the French system, and its stages were uh, follows. First, bachelors. Degree lasted uh, three years, a certificate of in depth studies, and it lasted one year, a third degree doctorate, and it lasts two years, and a state doctorate degree with a duration of five years to prepare. After that, uh, as you know, that uh, be before uh, 1970, the high ministry of education depend to the ministry, to the educational ministry. So 
This stage begins with the history of the event of the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific uh, Induction in the year of 1970, which is of pivotal date at the reform at the top of the educational system pyramid. Immediately after the year, an important reform came. The reform charter includes a comprehensive strategy for the future of higher education in Algeria. This project focused on four main objectives, uh, diversity, diversification and intensification of university, increasing the number of universities all over the, the country, improving the educational level, replacing the French language with Arabic, except for the scientific ones, and most of humanitarian discipline adopt the national language, which is Arabic. The development of higher education and the role of scientific research in cre creating international cooperation mechanism through national and international research programs. After 1998, this was characterized by legislative and structural expansion and partial reform. The Higher Education Directive Act was established in September 1998. The decision to organize the university in the form of college, creating joint, joint tracks for the new baccalaureate holder, establishing the university center. At this stage, higher, higher education system in the world were directed towards LMD, which is licensed master and doctorate, which made Algeria attack a great importance to reforming its university educational system in order to keep pace with globalization and accelerating technical technology taking place in the Western world. Higher education is under the authority of a government minister who prepare and implement government policy on higher education and scientific research. A regional distribution, distribution is made in relation to the socioeconomic network of each region and the number of students. Algeria account now 54 universities, nine university centers, 37 national higher schools, and 11 higher normal schools. Scientific research a national priority in the education policy is defined by a legal framework. Its target it is, is to set up links between scientific research carried out in university and other sectors and abroad. Currently, the scientific research network under supervision includes six agencies, 19 centers, 12 units, and 1,472 laboratories. The mechanism of international cooperation adopted by the Algerian state in the field of higher education and scientific research includes professor and researcher in various scientific, uh, scientific uh, research fields. And this is within exchange program, such as allocating scholarships, uh, uh, the benefit of professor researchers and doctoral students. Among this, available grants we find, for example, Erasmus and PROFAS, and a process and exchange scientific missions. In Algeria, and exactly in Tlemcen University, the Pan-African University of Water, Energy, and Climate Change Science, POWS, which is called POWS, contributes to the sustainable development of Africa. It is the unique in North Africa. POWS offers two years master programs in accordance with international St standards, a master in water science and a master in water energy and climate change. Algeria has several cooperation relations with Arab and European countries in the field of higher education and scientific research, whether at the level of university institutions or at the level of uh, research centers and research projects. Finally, it is evident that the Algerian state gave great attention to higher education and scientific research, especially after independence. And it is still striving hard and changing more effort and changing more efforts benefit for the experience of foreign university for the success for the success of their system to achieve the development and the economical role 
and keep pace with scientific development and interaction and interaction in knowledge society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yusfi. Do you want to come? So our next speaker is Dr. Amir Lebdiwi, and he's going to talk to us about Algeria's economic development since independence, reflections on the past 60 years, and their implications for the future. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today, uh, especially on such an occasion to, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of, uh, of, of our independence. So it's, and it was particularly interesting to hear the insights from this morning and, and, uh, and the presenter just before me on, on what, the, what the history actually teaches us about our identity and potentially about where we are, where we are going. So today, the, the topic that I wanted to address um, is the issue of industrialization. And the reason why is not only because that's what I work on, but also because it's impossible to dissociate Algeria's independence with the theme of industrialization. And in fact, because the Algerian revolution was a way to achieve political independence, but industrialization was also perceived as the way to achieve economic independence uh, after, uh, after political independence. And it has captured the collective imagination of Algerians in terms of you know, becoming an industrialized nation, being economically free as well. Uh, leaders after independence were, were imagining that Algeria would become the Japan of Africa. Right, becoming the, the, the industrial engine. And in fact, uh, Martin was mentioning some of the, some of the Algerian cinematography right? and, and, and how it portrays Algerian identity. This is also something, for those of you who have watched uh, Al Wahrani, the, the men from Oran, there is also moments in which they, kind of, they say, when they think about, you know, maybe we, they can build a little shuttle or maybe they can develop this kind of industry or the wood sector. So, so the industrialization is very much part of, of Algeria's post-colonial aspirations. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the, the crest of the uh, Republic of Algeria, there is a factory, right? So it's very much on in the collective identity and uh, the, the ambition to achieve industrialization goals. I only have 10 minutes, uh, but I thought, so I'll have to focus on a few messages, but I thought because we're celebrating six decades of, of independence, I'll focus on, on six main messages briefly, but thinking about, you know, why looking at our past industrial experiences, uh, both successes and challenges, can, can tell us about you know, the, the present and the future of where uh, we can go. So the first message is, though Algeria was a relatively industrialized colony compared to some other colonies that were mostly just extractivist or focused on agriculture, Algeria was left with considerable challenges in terms of promoting industrialization at independence. There was a massive drain of, of skilled workers of operating factories after independence, right? So uh, Pianois that went back to, to France, but also the technological dependence, right? On French uh, industries and French technologies that prevailed. But despite so on the, the dependence on the former colonial power, but despite this, there were some quick successes. Uh, by 1965, so only three years after independence, about 500 factories were reopened uh, and new factories were being created, uh, which, uh, which is a testament to the collective will that Algerians had to industrial aspirations uh, after independence. And something to note as well is there are reports that a lot of those initiatives to reopen factories were initiatives led by workers, right? So not necessarily something that is, you know, uh, top to bottom, but everybody being involved to figure out how to kickstart industrialization again. Which leads me to the second message, which is that there were considerable 
achievements that need to be recognized until this day uh, in terms of industrialization during the Boumediene period. And this is perhaps the part of Algen history where industrialization progressed the fastest. Uh, using the, the concept of industrializing industries uh, coined by the French economist de Bernis. And there was this vision even of petroleum as a catalyst for industrialization. So from the inception and in policy documents and policy speeches, uh, oil, uh, the, 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 the leaders at the time didn't necessarily see the country as being oil dependent, but thought that the oil can be used to foster manufacturing, to develop different types of industries. And this is how Algeria developed um, a steel sector, an automotive sector, actually the first engine ever manufactured in Africa, right, at industrial scale uh, at the time, uh, and the fertilizer industries to promote agri agriculture, as, uh, as so on. And in fact, the initial successes were so rapid that Algeria was seen as an industrial development model that formed the basis of policy lessons in other post-colonial states. Some of you might be aware of, uh, might know Hugh Roberts, is a British historian who works on, on Algeria. And he tells the story of the way he got into Algeria was doing his PhD in the 1970s. Um, and people in, in Oxford and people at the time were talking about the Algerian industrial development model. And he thought, so what's going on there? I want to, to do this research. And he went there. In the, he changed topics in the end, but just to show that this is something that uh, was making waves at the time. However, and that's my third message, this industrial industrialization model was short-lived, right? And, and, and faced limitations over time. Uh, and that is something that is important to acknowledge and think about as it also forms and informs you know, the present and future in terms of what we can do better. Uh, Boumedien's death in 1967, uh, sorry, 1978, uh, led to the disruption of the industrial strategy as successive leaders were not as interested in, in industrial uh, models and industrial policy. Uh, and to some extent, you know, one can say that this was the main hurdle, right? Perhaps they needed more time for all the industry to become competitive, right? Through learning by doing, uh, through, you know, gradual technological capability accumulation. You know, it took Toyota 40 years to become uh, profitable, right? In terms of 40 years of learning by doing until reaching global competitiveness. And this is part of the industrial process. However, we need to acknowledge that there were also perhaps errors of omission, right, in the design of the strategy uh, to begin with, as the strategy was mostly had an inward oriented um, component. So modeled a, a little bit after the, the USSR model, right? So kind of producing for the domestic market without much intention, right, to, to go into exports. And this is perhaps one of the main difference between the East Asian uh, industrialization model, right, or that of Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, and even China nowadays, to the path that Algeria had taken, because there was this switch at some point after being inward oriented, right, focusing on reducing imports, there was this switch towards promoting exports. And uh, I've had the chance to meet and interview people who had worked on uh, on the country's industrial strategy with Boumediene, and, and, and some of them claim that Towards the, the end of, shortly before his death, Boumediene was starting to change his mind about, you know, having an outward oriented industrial strategy. That's something that, you know, we, we can never know what would have been the effect of it or whether it would happen. But something that we can say uh, with more certainty is that the objective of Algeria's industrialization was social equity, full employment, but not necessarily competitiveness, right? Uh, at least in the early stages. Um, and since then, and that leads to my message four, um, Algeria has experienced a premature deindustrialization, right? If you look at different indicators in terms of uh, industrial employment relatively to employment in agriculture and services or manufacturing value added, it has dropped after, you know, in the 80s, 90s, um, uh, and, uh, and even in the 2000s and 2010, it has stagnated, but never went back to the pre-1980 uh, levels. 
And that has to do with the fact that over, you know, in more recent decades, and that's my fifth message, the economic model, and especially the all revenue management model, has enabled some progress in terms of fueling consumption, uh, uh, social consumption, moder- of especially necessity goods, modernization of infrastructure, but did not necessarily translate into fueling uh, industrialization and manufacturing the way it was done perhaps in other countries like Malaysia, where all revenues were used for, uh, in large parts, to fuel uh, industrial competitiveness, right? Um, so in a way, a lot of the resources also used for fiscal stabilization, right? In foreign reserves or in the Fonds de Régulation des Recettes. Uh, but there wasn't, there was much less investments into the manufacturing sector and long-term competitiveness. Which leads me to the last message, which is that nowadays, industrialization remains as important uh, as ever uh, for Algerian society and Algeria's future. Uh, and as Algerians look for a path uh, to industrialization, uh, several lessons can be learned, not only from international experiences of others who've done things differently, but also from our own history in terms of the successes that were achieved, the limitations and challenges and shortcomings that were faced. Um, and two of which are the, the outward orientation right, of industrialization models nowadays, But we also need to recognize that the conditions of industrializations have also dramatically changed since the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. So as we look for new models, new things need to be considered that weren't necessarily considered before. And one of which has to do with the the rise uh, of global value chains in a globalized world. So nowadays, countries don't industrialize anymore by developing entire sectors, entire industries, right? But they industrialize by focusing on specific activities within global value chains, right? They integrate those chains uh, with uh, uh, um, and and upgrade uh, within them. The other thing that perhaps is worth ending on is the issue of climate change. As the world decarbonizes, it's something that is extremely relevant to Algeria nowadays, but as the world decarbonizes its economic systems, the demand for oil may drop, and as Algeria look for a path to diversify its economy, there are also opportunities that arise from what they call green industrialization, right? Which was not in the agenda a few decades ago. Uh, and many opportunities for Algeria to learn, to, uh, to, to, to seize, right, in the context of a low carbon, uh, uh, a low carbon future. Uh, and that future will be essential because, you know, as you know, everybody runs out of oil eventually. But uh, yeah, so that's what I wanted to to end on in terms of the still and persevering need for industrialization and uh, the taking stock of what has been achieved, what has been done right, and the challenges that remain for the future and uh, of of economic independence in Algeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, our last speaker in this panel is Dr. Mekia Neja, who's going to talk to us about making the case for colonialism and colonial studies in uh, MENA knowledge production, a critic. Uh, hello. hello. Uh, I'm very happy to share their, uh, this panel with you. Also, thank you for inviting me. I will shift a little bit my topic to the epistem of colonial studies. Um, in the world stage. So making the case for colonialism and colonial studies uh, is an attempt to explore the way in which colonial logic animates concepts and narratives in knowledge produced in, on MENA and post-colonial world and how the disciplinary frameworks or canons of thought that are used to organize knowledge, usually from the center, limit our understandings and imaginaries, not of the margins, but also the founding premises of these concepts and narratives. So speaking and talking about colonialism is not a mere narrating uh, or telling a past story. Colonization is not over for many reasons. And one of uh, these reasons is that part of modern um, predicament 
such as democracy, enlightenment, freedom, liber liberal values, have been raised in tandem with colonial enterprise. For that, we need to examine the present uh, to addressing the past. The past is the present, and the present had a lot to do with the past. So we aim to, to examine, to reconsider in colonization that the inception of thinking about democracy, ethics, and equality was limited to the Europeans, Why simultaneously the violence, the humanization, and oppression were uh, empirically operating on the ground, and particularly, I mean, Algeria. So as a certain scholar, I would like to approach or reapproach which part of colonial experience matter for the colonized people, asking what are the limits of liberals and more democracy reposition? Who are the progenitors um, and authors of world liberal order, democracy and progress, and why? In order to understand contemporary uh, post-colonial world, I pick up two items to analyze, Algeria and Alexis de Tocqueville, as examples to decipher cognitively the colonial institute system. So um, the objective of invoking the locus of democracy and its inherent interrelations or implications, if any, with colonial logic is to provide new sites of critique and studies. We aim what we, what we are aiming to do, not to refute the historical narratives on colonialism, rather is to add more stories from other geographies and social contexts, adding many other uh, colonial subject stories, questioning some um, what I call um, epistemic ambiguities. We try to uh, problematize the non-embodied connections and ideas between democracy and colonialism in historical accounts, reassessing which matters of freedom, values, and democratic inceptions and colonialism merit our attention and equal, equally important, how imperial and rational, rationalized knowledge orders condition and at times constrain the ways in which we are able to define what the problems of the post-colonial world politics are. Um, prior to our analysis, let's start with colonial history, power, and knowledge as briefly. What is at stake is the challenge to visualize the interplay of historicity of what happened and that which is said to have happened, which is usually included, quoting from Michel Rothrouillot. What history is matter less than how history works, how history functions, because the pastness of the future is the process of becoming what we are. The post-colonial is in the process of becoming. It's about to counter narrate the unfolding narratives, as I said, but to provide new strategies which help us to reposition and generate new narratives, countering inequalities of power of the past as it is, it is said to have happened. So our objective to make um, students, scholars, researchers to think across the problems of the text, of the archive, to enable them to understand the politics of representation, the, complexis, the complexities, the subtleties of the relation between what they were reading and seeing and to comprehend the nature of that relation as a relation of power. The historical representations must not be considered as vehicles of knowledge transmission of past events, um, but must establish some relation to that knowledge by learning and unlearning. As Trouillot argued and Jack Goody also, the production of history reveals entanglement of historicity with power that applies not only in the archives, but also dominates the processes and practices by which the pastness is authenticated, ratified, and, and organized at the end as knowledge. Coming here, uh, we can find such intersectionality of the power of knowledge and power of narration telling a story because the boundary between either processes is often quite fluid. So regarding Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville is well known by his seminal book, De la Démocratie en Amérique, but he should also be known for his essays, Ses essais sur l'Algérie, where he advocates a clearly and explicit incitement to practice razias, la politique des terres brûlées in Algeria. We have to interrogate what made Tocqueville think so brilliantly about liberalist values, think oppressively to put an end to the lives of other peoples. So 
a critic. Many scholars have written scrutiny on Tocqueville. Most impactful analyses, serious analyses, have been made by uh, Sherry Welsh and the remarkable works of Jennifer Pott, among others. However, their writings stop short to reapproach the nexus of colonial logic with liberal framings in Tocqueville men's side, with the exception of the hard critics of Olivier Le Courgrand-Maison and Zvetan Todorov. So contextually, the point to unlearn here is when Tocqueville openly and explicitly embraced violent subjugation of the colonized as a necessity of France empire prestige, he was considered just, in their critics, insensible arist aristocratic or having maladresse politique. Uh, he was inconsistent, paradoxical in his positions. All of these sorts of academic jests make him appear totally fuzzy and ambivalent with eventual psychic pathology or disorder. So these unjustified and unexplanatory arguments intend to keep him subliminal in his democratic part at the end, while concealing and laying him away as a violent colonial percussor. What does Tocqueville oppressive colonial logic mean for the study of democracy and justice in the world now, I'm, I'm asking. So this, despite being um, a democracy advocate and fervor admirer of political freedom and the French Revolution, he was an active parliamentary in French empire as a colonial officer who provided scrutiny political recommendation essays on Algeria during a decade from 1837 to 1847. These essays were anything but tactical policy, how to subjugate the Algerian indigenous. Even though Tocqueville could empathize, for example, with the Indians in America, but on the other hand, he incited to annihilate the barbarians in Algeria. Um, the paradoxical positionality disclose the Russian and colonial assumptions that underpin the foundations of democracy and sovereignty. Eventually overlooked at the linkage we can find between the French Revolution achievement and the colonization undertaken immediately after that in, in 19 and 20 centuries. We can ask to what, uh, to what extent the liberal democratic trajectory was concomitant with colonial and Russian system. So the real politic of Tocqueville was that colonization provided the most potent impetus for the transformation of European ethnocentrism into scientific crises of or epistemic violence. To civilize is to colonize. The most stri striking issue about Tocqueville taught in one hand that his audacity to make Algeria as an experimentary laboratory of colonial administration in empirical and material terms where the fact of domination must be corollary subject to and conditioned by colonization. On the other hand, he made a rationale for democratic model in France. The lines between his sociological analysis and moral judgment and political prescriptions are more than puzzling. He was assiduous Really, he was a assiduous and pertinent analyst obsessed by the place of France in the world. He was a nationalist imperialist whose slogan was dominate to colonize and colonize to extermination with no reservations. What are we supposed to learn now? So it is important to understand the historical account based on the memory of the people who underwent any sort of any kind of domination, occupation, colonization by foreign power. As simply moving to, toward the origin of democracy thinking, we can find that was absolutely not for humanity or freedom of the world. It was rationalized in sense that it allows for white people to subjugate other non-white white people because they were considered ontologically inferior. The canonization of Tocqueville taught on democracy should be placed in dialogic with his canonization on the colonization of Algeria and the consolidation of the Algerian as subject. And such critics should impact our pedagogy in envisioning, visualize what colonial experiences suppose for peoples who underwent different degrees of subjugation and expropriation. The, the colonial fact was not a random phenomena, nor isolated from the modern political system. It was planned, strategized, and engineer it. It represents the hard item of bargaining on locus of democracy and colonialism simultaneously. We argue that colonialism, the power knowledge relations and the democracy in America emerged to be co-constitutive, at least in Tocqueville, 
ideal uh, system. Coming to conclusion, what are we supposed to do? What are the solving options? My concluding notes deal more with methodology, with what methodic disturbance, epistemic disturbance. We sense and consider the responsibility to alter the nature of this nexus, altering its Eurocentric modus, modus operandi, revealing and reestablishing the invisible, disrupting um, the colonial gaze in knowledge production about the MENA and the post-colonial world through a reparatory project, um, which is able to recognize the genealogy of interconnectedness of liberal order with colonialism. That sums up the ability to respond to challenges and suggestions from other geographies, other historians, other scholars, and figure out the category of evidence in which such responses must be encoded. I should call to disturb the effort of mainstream discourse to sustain the originary alienation that inaugurated the democracy and the modern disposition of nation state which were, we should remember, themselves the site of colonial experimentation and domination. Uh, um, uh, calling to a decolonial move implies challenging the enduring Eurocentric premises through deciphering epistemically attitude, values, dispositions, and what the view that get, that, what the views that get learned and learned constitute and unconstitute while studying MENA. Quoting from Audrey Alejandro in a reflexive frame, she said, it's not to show how much room we can get to look at the knowledge produced on, knowledge, on colonialism, but to look to the many facets standpoints which enable us to visualize the experience of the colonized people and relegate it to the systematic analysis regarding the behavior of the post-colonial state as such. Thank you so very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Anisha. Right, so um, let me have a look at the time. So we don't have a lot of time for discussion and questions. I can see that there's a couple of questions already online. So I'm just going to go straight to the questions. And then if anyone in the audience here has any question, I can take them. So the first question uh, is uh, for Dr. Amen. So Dr. Amel, what is required to make Algeria's education system fit for a 21st century globalized um, labor market? Okay, thank you very much for this uh, question. The short questions that make, uh, and but the, uh, in deep in uh, uh, deep in their uh, meaning. So I uh, I can answer briefly but precisely the openness of the algerian government and the adoption of an international uh, strategy that keeps pace uh, with the international labor market uh, this is uh, what uh, what i can say about this question, as well as achievement, the quality of education and learning for the Algerian universities and rising the level of their qualification. Uh, what the global, also what the global uh, job market demands. I think uh, also that the Algerian university uh, goes in ways, in way of uh, reform. It reform itself uh, by, uh, by the demand of uh, uh, of the 20, 21st century uh, globalization labor market. I think uh, I uh, have uh, answered this uh, question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Never mind. I'll, I'll move on to the other question. Yes, we have another question. I'm not sure it's, it's just for you. I think this is for everyone. So there's a question from an anonymous attendee. How, how has the very notorious brain drain facing uh, the Maghreb impacted, impacted Algeria's industrial plan? I think it's for you, uh, Ania. Yeah. 
Um, and do you think those that had all their education and studies outside in France, the UK, Canada, funded by the Algerian state should return to support the economy or pay back the funds? <laughs> okay. Yeah, these are good questions, um, and they're somehow related. Yeah, I think these are good questions, and which are somehow related in terms of well, the most important resource that a country has is the human capital, right? And it's in that sense that the fact that many of the skilled engineers that were operating industries in colonial Algeria, the fact that they were Uh, not indigenous Algerians and left after independence. This is what, you know, it, this is the, 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 the challenge that it posed for post-colonial Algeria, right? So it's not, this is to go beyond this simplistic argument to say that there were many factories in Algeria. So it was, there were roads and factories, so they were set for industrialization. That's not true because the people who were trained by the colonial administration to operate them Were, were gone. Um, and the challenge that it took to reopen them is a, is, is a tremendous one that, that uh, deserves particular attention. And then talking about the human capital side of things, we go back to the question of scholarship, which is, a, which is a good one, an important one. And the question, I think everyone probably has an opinion on it, different, and some of you might disagree, but I look forward to hear it. The answer is probably that it depends. On one hand, most people who receive taxpayers' money to study abroad, to fulfill particular, you know, to acquire particular skills, to contribute to the economy, should go back and help. However, there are instances in which when you build a diaspora, a skilled diaspora overseas, you can have returns on investments that can exceed whether you just have somebody that goes back that might not actually use the same skills to the same level, right? And you see it in many different countries. You have entire industries that have emerged in developing countries thanks to skilled diaspora sent overseas, right? For example, the whole IT sector in India is basically Indians that were sent to study Uh, computer science in the United States that stayed, worked for Google for in Silicon Valley, and then at some point went back with even more, not just the skills, but also the experience and contributed again. But obviously, this depends on the context. Hopefully that people can bring back whatever they acquire overseas, even if they stay uh, longer. Uh, the other thing to also say, and uh, asking the location, I think uh, ML would be much more, you know, have a much more informed opinion on it is uh, do scholarship to what extent do scholarships help you know generate human capital for you know sending people overseas and then to actually come back when you're not sure compared to investing the same money in Algerian universities so you send a scholarship to the UK it's about about 50k a year probably 30k with living expenses you can probably hire one professor even from overseas uh, or you know locally or whatever to come to Algeria and actually teach, you know, probably 50 people for the same amount of money. So leaving the question out there in terms of, you know, what are the best ways to stimulate human capital uh, and the role of the skilled uh, diaspora sent overseas uh, and so on. And the last thing is also, this also depends on the policy back home as well, right? If there is a plan to reintegrate people sent overseas, if the people are sent overseas to study topics in which jobs are being created, Uh, back home for people to go back to, uh, or if they're, you know, sent overseas to study topics in which their, you know, their skills are not going to be maximized or used to their full potential uh, when they return to Algeria. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Yusfi, do you want to add anything or Dr. Neja? Yes, uh, I have something to add uh, about uh, the policy um, ab about the policy of industri industrial de industrialization. Uh, the policy that uh, Algeria adopt after uh, independence uh, that uh, Mr. Dr. Amir has uh, evoked. I think that uh, this uh, policy has failed as, for example, uh, Uh, you know that, uh, for example, uh, the the Hajar in Annaba or the SNS of uh, uh, Ghazawat. I think uh, because this failure is because of the 
the, the Algerian government want uh, to uh, to explore in this sector, but I think that uh, it was not well studied because uh, just after the independence, uh, they want to to big uh, big project big project in industry, but uh, I think uh, that not uh, that it that uh, they were not uh, well uh, studied. Not uh, for the, for example, geogra the geographical one. Uh, their aim at, this, at that period is uh, is uh, to Im to absorb uh, in employment and uh, to give wealth, society, and economic to the to the country. But uh, they left uh, other uh, other sides. I think that. I don't know if uh, Dr. Amin is uh, is sharing my opinion. No, no, these are very interesting thoughts. And it's interesting that you mentioned Al-Hajjar because uh, I think this industrial complex, which is a steel complex, actually reflects the history of Algerian industrialization from being, you know, uh, an impressive effort towards building a steel industry in a post-colonial state to facing a lot of shortcomings and, and, and slowing down. And nowadays, I mentioned climate change to end, but if we look at Al-Hajjar, the future of the steel industry is actually green steel, right? Steel. Either SNS in, in Ghazawat, either the same one in the one in the east of uh, the, the Algeria, in the east of Algeria, and the other in the west of Algeria, at the opposite of the, the same country, I think. Uh, yes? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, I think there's a hand raised online from Elise Mazurier. I'm not sure if it's the hand from the first panel or if it's a new hand. So I'm just going to unmute you and then you can tell us. Yes, thank you. Um, it's... Um, also a question which I wrote in the chat because I was um, um, I was astonished when you quoted that um, um, Japan was compared to Algeria and, and that Algeria would become the new uh, Japan economically. And I was wondering if there had been any comparison with the flying geese model because the Flying geese model has been used for East Asia to explain that Japan uh, would economically um, also that the other countries of the regions in different ways would benefit from Japan's growth and take up Japan's industrial role as Japan would go more in the tertiary sector. And I was wondering if there had been also a comparison of this model applied to Algeria and the Maghreb region. And also because of the um, context of uh, American occupation uh, in Japan, if there had been any comparisons or reflections on um, the systems of occupations and occupation as a phenomenon um, compared to colonialism. Um, yes, 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 you can take it first. Thank you, Elise, for a very interesting and perceptive question. The interesting thing about Japan is, uh, you know, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first country that recognized Algeria after independence, according to my knowledge. Um, is that correct? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe it's the first country that has recognized Algeria <laughs> as an independent state. No? You, you don't think so? Sorry, I don't think so, because the GPRA before 1962 yeah. was already recognized by a number of, yeah. of places. So they, they might have been the first ones in 1962, but even that. Yeah. Okay, so anyways, maybe I'll check my, 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 my information. But uh, you mentioned the flying geese model, but just to put things into a historical perspective, the time in which Algeria, by the way, it was not being compared to Japan. It was the aspiration was to become the Japan of Africa. Um, and at the time, the flying geese had not yet flown. 
right? So South Korea, Taiwan, uh, uh, Hong Kong, and so on. Uh, had it was basically a time where they were also still industrializing, and you can see the kind of their success was from the 1960s up until uh, nowadays. But at the time, Japan was more of the reference for industrialization that Algeria was uh, trying to emulate. In terms of comparisons with uh, with other South African countries, I'm not entirely sure, but maybe that's something that can be discussed furthermore over you know, after the conference or or, or if you are in SOAS uh, and so on. Okay, thank you. So we have a few questions here in the audience. Uh, this, so who was first? <laughs> You, you go first. Okay, this question is for Dr. Amel. Um, how can universities or the government in general prevent uh, brain drain, which is basically la fuite des cerveaux in Algeria, because loads of students are leaving for countries like France and Canada. So even though we have universities, how can we prevent students from leaving and actually invest in the country? Um, also, another question for the panelists. Um, do you think that industrialization is actually a good thing for Algeria? Because um, if you look at the work conditions in Japan and other places in the West, it's not actually a healthy work-life balance. Whereas if you look at other countries in the Mediterranean and even France and Spain and everything, uh, it's very much a work to live compared to a live to work lifestyle um so yeah just how would that even be implemented in algeria when we have a much more relaxed way of life um so yeah <laughs> a bit too relaxed do you want to answer the question or is your question related yeah okay so we'll take your question okay uh, my question is destined uh, to Dr. Amal Yusfi, uh, it's the same. Uh, uh, doctor, how you can explain the phenomenon of 1,200 doctors who get the visa to France next uh, last uh, three months? Uh, do you think that it's a normal phenomenon or uh, it's, uh, we can say, a failed of system uh, or policy of education, higher education? This is the first question. Secondly, it's a uh, state to Mr. Labjani. How uh, do you think the um, Algerian NC um, affected by the value of globalization? How can I understand this? Thank you. Dr. Amel, I think both questions were for you. Yes, I am. Uh... I think that uh, I believe by uh, that the brain drain is less uh, this um, at this period, not uh, for example uh, at the period of the 90, uh, 90, 1990. That period Algeria uh, passed with uh, with a period which was uh, very uh, very uh, how to say it very difficult and uh, i think that uh, at that period uh, more uh, more la 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 fuite des cerveaux uh, that uh, uh, I, uh, was very important at that period but i think that uh, the reform at the university of, at the algerian university uh, at the uh, Uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, last uh, years uh, gives uh, uh, more opportunity uh, for uh, the uh, for the Algerian uh, lecturer and uh, and so on to uh, to keep uh, in the in Algeria. I think that. Uh, for the phenomenon uh, of uh, the doctors that uh, the, the second uh, intervener uh, speak about, I think uh, that it's 
it is not the failure of the system, nor the. I think that uh, at that period, uh, that uh, uh, I think that they want to have more uh, opportunity at uh, for uh, abroad, if uh, we can say. I think that. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, do you want to add anything or? Yeah, the question on the pace of Algerian pace of life and whether it matches, it, it's compatible with industrialization. I have to say, this is the first time I ever get asked uh, this question and it's nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one, an important one. I think that the main thing here is to still be able to sustain a tranquil pace of life you need to industrialize. So the question there is not so much in terms of stress levels, number of hours you put in per, per week, but the key point is productivity, right? If you have a high productivity per worker, you actually don't need to put in that many hours and you still have, you know, you don't have to kill yourself at work like the Japanese do. And I believe a few years ago, I mean, if, I mean, some of the country with highest, you know, MVA, manufacturing value added per capita are countries like Switzerland, the Netherlands, Sweden, right? I mean, these are not, you know, the kind of Japanese, it's Japan, Korea uh, of the world. These are countries where, you know, through increases in productivity, uh, using the right, you know, uh, production techniques, using the right technologies, industrial output is quite high compared to the amount of hours one is able to put. You mentioned Italy, France, but these are countries that Italy had industrialized, right? Now it, it affords... Uh, uh, a, a level of of, uh, of of income that is thanks to its past industrialization. France is also heavily industrialized. So, um, and in terms of number per hours, I recently heard that Mexicans work many more hours per week than the Japanese, right? But obviously this doesn't match. So there is a big cultural element there. Uh, and I think the issue that some of these industrialization, industrialized nations face, like Japan, may have more to do with specific cultural elements, right? That of Japanese society for good or for bad, uh, but they're not necessarily features of industrialization that have to be, uh, that symptoms that have to be present uh, in other countries as they industrialize as well, including, um, including Algeria. Thanks. Thank you. So we have a question from Mr. Sally. Well, thank you for all the speakers. Uh, my question is for uh, Amir Debdiwi. Uh, Algeria is still struggling in diversifying its economy. Um, we, 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 we have a lot of income from selling hydrocarbons products. So uh, I, I want to begin from your last thought, climate change. Do you think that um, the path uh, to decarbonizing the economy will be positive or negative in the current situation, the current economic situation. Thank you. That's your question. We probably could have an entire conference just to, <laughs> to discuss it and unpack it, but it's an extremely, extremely important one. And the answer is, it depends on the policies that are being used to tackle decarbonization. So if it's done in a not strategic way, decarbonization will have disastrous effects for the Algerian economy. But the thing is, a lot of it is outside of our control because it's global decarbonization. That means that, you know, can, uh, as you decarbonize economic systems, there'll be less demand for fossil fuels uh, or we will run out of fossil fuels before that because it's non-renewable. Uh, so in a way, and that will mean a loss of jobs in the fossil fuel sectors, uh, loss of public revenues uh, and foreign exchange. However, decarbonization also brings about a wide range of economic opportunities for countries that, you know, that surf it with the right angle. And renewable energy jobs, for example, there's a lot of jobs being created in the renewable energy sector, about 12 million globally but they're not distributed equally, right? Some countries, about four of them, China, the US, India, Brazil, and countries in the EU, capture like 80% of jobs in the renewable energy sector. 
right? But there is also a tremendous Alger uh, opportunity for countries like Algeria, which have solar energy potential, to use renewable energy to fuel industrialization, right? So nowadays in the business and financial world, you, there, is a, there is an appetite for decarbonized services and decarbonized sectors. But if you have renewables, that means that as you talked about al Hajjar, the drive nowadays is towards the production of zero carbon steel, right? Because steel is, is carbon intensive, it's energy intensive. So if you have the right conditions and you can produce renew, clean, renewable uh, uh, electricity uh, at, at, at a low cost, that opens up wide ranges in terms of pathways to diversification that are not otherwise uh, available. So these are the ways in which the decarbonization agenda could actually be an opportunity for uh, for countries like Algeria with the right uh, with the right strategy and, and policy tools. Thank you. I think we have no more. Uh, yes, we have one last one. Thank you very much for the presentation. I want to come back to the presentation made by Dr. Amir. First, thank you very much. I uh, was just, if you allow, Dr. Amir, that I, you delivered the presentation. You talked about six uh, messages. I just want to add what mes one message. The message is that uh, there is a lot of things happening in Al Algeria those days uh, to improve the climate of investment in the country and to improve and to develop the industry. You talked, uh, you told us about the history of industry and in, in Algeria. Yeah, there is a very attractive uh, investment law project. I read the draft, it's, it's very attractive. It has been debated in the parliament those days to improve the climate investment and to attract more uh, investment in Algeria to develop the economy. So by this law or and improving all the climate investments in Algeria, you are going to take like poverty, we will to develop the economy and also to tackle this issue, to resolve this issue of, of brain drain. By the way, brain drain, it's it's a it's international phenomenon, it's not a problem for Algeria and uh, that's normal. This movement uh, over the world between countries and uh, but, but what I want to say just the message that a lot of things are happening in Algeria to improve the situation and uh, to create opportunities and job for Algeria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Do you do you do you have anything to add to that? Or? Uh, no, I mean that that's absolutely true, uh, and there is an investment uh, change of investment law being planned. And I think these are the kind of ways in which, you know, the climate becomes more in line with 21st century challenges and the needs of the financial world and, and globalization. And, uh, and perhaps the last thing you asked about solar energy renewables, something I forgot, it wasn't in the scope of the presentation, but, you know, this agenda of renewables and, and, and transition, Algeria had been pioneering efforts actually since the 1980s. Actually, the center, the CDER Center for Centre de Développement des Énergies Renouvelables, which the mission is to actually develop low carbon technologies, right, through R&D. Uh, and these efforts start very, very early on. So in a way, it's kind of looking at, you know, some of the past aspirations seem that, you know, there is a sort of continuity in terms of embarking on new challenges. It's not kind of taken by surprise, but you see that there is a historical drive to try to, to, to be a pioneer in, in, some, uh, in, some, uh, in some fields which include uh, renewables. Thank you. I think there's no more questions, uh, neither online nor here in the audience. So I will ask you to thank with me our three speakers, um, Dr. Yusfi, Dr. Lebdiwi, and Dr. Neja for the Thank you to you here in the Brunei Gallery and to those of you uh, following us online for your interesting questions and for your enthusiasm. Um, I think you, you made the, the, the two panels um, very, very interesting and very exciting. Um, I'm going to invite Mr. Um, Hamid Sali uh, to come.
and uh, give us some concluding remarks. And thank you to our chair, uh, Aisha <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> It was very fun, actually. Um, I'm just going to change that. Yes, it, it was quite fun to chair this, uh, this event. Well, thank you very much, uh, Aisha Belhadi, for your brilliant moderation of the two panels. And I think it was planified to have this conference in about two hours and now I think yeah. we're in three hours. So thank you all of you for all your patience, for your patience. And uh, thank you for all our panelists. So um, uh, I would like to thank all the professors and the doctors for uh, the excellent presentation and the content of uh, their papers. Uh, Professor Martin Evans he is not uh, with us now. Ah, you are here. Hello. <laughs> That's great. So uh, he was very receptive for the idea of organizing this conference and uh, he will uh, honor us uh, next Monday at the Embassy of Algeria in London uh, with another lecture uh, on the occasion of Independence Day. So the invitation is open for all of you. Uh, I'm grateful to Professor uh, Belkassam Mekki also for uh, he, he has also shown a willingness to participate uh, despite his busy schedule. Uh, he will be organizing another event along uh, with Martin Evans in 17th of September in Dublin. Uh, I hope uh, we will be invited that day. Um, thank you, Dr. Amal Yusfi, uh, for... Uh, for her part, uh, was very willing to participate with us. Uh, the dean of uh, her uh, university, who recommended her, confirmed her high level, which she proved during her presentation. And a special thanks to Dr. Mekia Najjar, who was among uh, the first to be contacted uh, for the ceremony. She was highly recommended um, to us for her uh, research and her uh, and dedication to her field and uh, of speciality. Uh, I would like also uh, to thank Dr. Emil Abdiwi. Where is he? We are here. <laughs> for uh, your uh, great dedication and for taking up the challenge uh, of making a presentation on post-independence Algerian economy in 10 minutes. I was having discussion with him and I told him, if you can uh, present 16 years or 60 years of economy, in just 10 minutes, and I think you did it, and you can be registered in Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> uh, Dr. Aisha Belkadi, you are excellent. Uh, I thank you for uh, you were kindly, and uh, you kindly accepted to host the two workshops with great success and ease, considering the short notice. Uh, on the same, in the same notes, I. Yeah, so on the same note, I wish Dr. Arthur Asarraf uh, a speedy recovery after the uh, unfortunate positive test result for COVID-19. Uh, last but not least, I cannot conclude uh, without presenting my warm thanks and gratitude to Dr. Ida Haji Vayanis. Uh, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Wine Doling, uh, the chair of uh, Center of Africa for the organization and the follow-up uh, on the program point by point. Uh, truly without your input, uh, Mrs. Ida and Mr. Wine, uh, this conference could not be, could not take place. Uh, to all of you and the SOAS University of London, as well as all the participants present uh, or online, a big round of applause. Well, thank you very much.